Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Bove in Ontario, Canada, with episode number 85 of The Yacking Show. And this is where we talk about life, business, and more, and we bring you tips and ideas for a changing world. We always have an interesting lineup of guests. Today's guest is no exception. It's a gentleman who I have spoken to several times, and I'm telling you he's going to be interesting. But it's not my job to introduce him. It's Kathleen's job. So first, let me welcome Kathleen. Hello, Kathleen. How are we doing today? Hello, Peter. I'm doing well. Thank you. And thank you all so very much for tuning in to our show. We so appreciate you and we love reading your comments. So do please keep them coming. And if anyone out there is interested in becoming a guest on our show, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to either Peter or myself. And if you're enjoying our shows, we would invite you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You would make our day. And uh, as Peter said, we do have another special guest with us today. His name, and I hope I get it correctly, it's uh, Giuseppe Fustaci. Fustaci, Fustaci. <laughs> we Fustaci, welcome Giuseppe. <laughs> How are yeah, you today? Uh, I'm great. Uh, it is Inauguration Day in America, and I'm feeling very optimistic. Wonderful. We're happy to hear it. And so why don't you go ahead and tell um, our audience a little bit about your background. Now, we, uh, you are a successful business owner. You currently own the Stick Shift Driving Academy, and we'll get to that in a moment. But you're also an SEO, which is Search Engine Optimization Specialist, as well as a pay-per-click expert. Um, so perhaps you can tell our audience, as I said, a little bit about your background, because it's sort of interesting. You do have a degree in psychology as well as organizational behavior. I'm interested to see how you ended up in the business world. So go ahead and tell our audience. And first, where are you located? Well, uh, so in a non-pandemic world, I'd be in Boston, uh, but uh, late last summer, my girlfriend and I put all of our stuff in storage and we've been traveling across the country and we'll continue to do so until her office reopens and life returns to normal. So right now I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, Excellent. So we'll be here for about a month or so. And then uh, we'll meander our way through the Appalachian trail and uh, the East coast for a bit. Nice. Uh, and a bit warmer yeah. than we are, I guess too. Eh? <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. Over the weekend. I, I mean, I got a slight sunburn last weekend. <laughs> oh. It's beautiful down here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell uh, you how cold it is here. So, <laughs> but it is cold. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. So, um, you know, in retrospect, there's a, there's an obvious quasi linearity to how I've ended up here professionally. Going through it, it felt anything but linear. Um, at a high level, what I found in working in the startup world for many years in, in the marketing world, um, ultimately, I've found a way of identifying and reducing risk um, in business, at least certain aspects of it through the lens of marketing and sales. Um, and so I, I started down that path, actually. The first startup I did out of college, we bombed miserably. Like if you were to have a checklist of all the things to not do, we did them. Um, but if you were to ask an MBA, we did all the things the right way. And I don't mean to disparage MBAs, um, but I, I learned how real startups that actually succeed are launched and they're nothing like what is traditionally taught in the business world of, you know, having a business plan and raising capital and, and whatever. Um, ultimately what I learned is that sales risk is the, usually it's the only risk that you can't solve for on your own. Um, so, you know, if you think about Elon Musk, for example, you know, he's putting rockets into space that's execution risk. Like either you can get the rock into space or you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and it's with very rare exception, there really usually is not execution risk. Like unless if you're trying to put a rocket into space or uh, you're trying to invent a drug or you're really trying to do something that's incredibly difficult from an engineering perspective, most of the time you can engineer a solution. Mm -hmm. um, but 
most of the time, early stage startups put all of their time and effort into building a product. Really big problem is, what if nobody wants to buy that? Well, I learned that problem the hard way by building something that nobody wanted to buy. Everyone said it sounded good, but when it came time to sign contracts, they didn't make mm -hmm. any sales. Anyway, fast forward, um, I, I learned about this methodology of basically building as little as physically possible so that you can get something in front of a customer and get their feedback about how and why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you go into that conversation assuming that what you've built is wrong. But until you put it in front of a customer and until you ask for the sale, you don't really get specific useful feedback about how it's wrong and why it's wrong and what needs to change in order to make the sale happen. Um, and so that's why I learned paid search and search engine optimization is the idea there is that if someone's going into Google or Yahoo or whatever, and they're typing in the name of a product or the name of a service, and they're adding attributes and features to that search query, you can infer from those queries, what do people care about? What do they not care about? Mm. Um, and you're getting in front of the people who are raising their hand saying, hey, I have this problem. Mm. Somebody please talk to me. Um, so uh, it's really, it, it's leading with trying to make the sale and then reverse engineering from that sales conversation. What do you need to build? Mm hmm Interesting. So <clears throat> that um, goes way into what I was going to ask you, <clears throat> and that's because I, I know you are a 10-year veteran in digital marketing, probably more by now, uh, specializing in SEO and pay-per-click. So <clears throat> a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs that Kathleen and I come across, don't appreciate the importance of what you've just been talking about, and they go exactly what you're saying. They keep on trying to build a perfect product without checking that people are going to buy it. So in a nutshell, how would you explain the importance of digital marketing, especially digital marketing for entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, there's a variety of layers to it, but ultimately for me, it just, it boils down to mitigating risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just mitigating the risks of the unknown and, you know, Demand risk, you cannot solve for if nobody wants to buy what you're selling or to be more general, if nobody has a problem that's painful enough that they're willing to pay for a solution, th there's nothing that you can do to change that. You no. can't create a problem. Um, or well, I shouldn't say you can't. It takes an exceptional degree of skill and luck to create a business that solves a problem that nobody had before. You know, Facebook is a perfect example, mm -hmm. but Facebook is the exception that proves the rule. Nobody had a social media problem. No one was raising their hand saying, hey, I want a social network. Mm -hmm. um, but you could argue to a certain degree uh, what Facebook actually sells is ad targeting. Yeah. And people in advertising have always had an ad targeting problem. Um, and I'm getting a bit off topic. So um, that's how I think about it. Nobody wants to buy what you're selling or building for that matter. Um, you really have to solve for the risk that's going to uh, get in the way of success until and, and really solve first solve for the thing that's most likely to fail. Because if, if there's something that's very likely to fail and its failure is going to prevent your forward progress, solve for that first. Sure. Don't solve for that last. Right. And producing a product is the easiest risk to solve, unless mm -hmm. if you're putting rockets into space. But for the kind of things that I'm going to work on, and probably most people would work on, building the product, there's really no risk there. Sorry, carry on, Kathleen. Um, I was just going to ask you, for the audience out there that isn't familiar doesn't really have a firm understanding of search engine optimization and pay-per-click. Can you just run down what that is exactly and how it works and how do you work with it? So with paid search, it's fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, I give Google a list of keywords and I say, hey, Google, um, if somebody searches for one of these words, show my advertisement. So in my case, if someone types in stick shift driving lessons, show my ad for stick shift driving lessons. 
Um, and I pay Google every time somebody clicks on my advertisement after they search. So they search for stick shift driving lessons, Google shows my ad, the user clicks, and then Google charges me money. Um, and it's extremely fast. I can create a campaign and launch it and start generating clicks within a day uh, or even less. Search engine optimization is uh, about communicating to Google what topic my website is about and what searches my website is relevant for. Um, and at a very, very high level, that really boils down to the content on my site. You know, if I have a lot of content that's about learning stick shift and driving stick shift, Google sees that, okay, I, I'm, I'm an authority on this topic. Um, it also has to do with the links that I'm getting to my website. If everyone who, you know, the who's who of the automotive world, if they are linking to me and Google sees that, wow, these authorities on cars are linking to this website that talks about stick shift driving lessons. Okay. You know, um, if the president gives me a shout out, that tells you something about, um, about my website because the president said something about me. So, you know, there's a lot of trust and authority there. Um, versus if the guy down the corner gives me a shout out, nobody cares. Um, so Google is looking at, you know, what kinds of links do I have pointing to my website and uh, how authoritative are those sources? Uh, and then uh, the third pillar is the speed. So, you know, how quickly does my website load um, and do I have certain technical things established that just tell Google that I have a high quality website from a, a technical perspective? Right, hmm. right. Very good. Mark, Very good. You have several business interests which one excites you the most the the underlying philosophy behind stick shift oh. so stick shift is an instance of a larger trend or opportunity that i'm seeing mm -hmm. um, so the way our customers find us is they usually go into their mobile device uh, and they type in or they say stick shift driving lessons near me they go on our website, they click around a bit, they call, um, and then they make a purchase. Mm -hmm. Mobile search, so people going into their mobile phones and typing in or speaking uh, products and services near me represents 40% of all search activity on mobile. Wow. Um, and mobile is the fastest growing digital channel. Right. So it's the biggest slice of the fastest growing pie, if pies were to grow. Um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of products and services that people need, plumber near me, electrician near me, um, bicycle repair shop near me, what have you. Small and medium-sized businesses are terrible at digital marketing and sales. Uh, you know, I don't know last time you tried to buy something locally, but just trying to get someone on the phone to answer your question is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm building is the back end of um, digital marketing and remote sales for uh, local service businesses. Mm. So the way the... I, and I do not mean to put myself up on a pedestal. Um, I still rent and I cook my own dinner. I shop at Costco. Like I am far from a huge success. But I liken it to the way Jeff Bezos chose books to start Amazon. You know, mm -hmm. he chose books for very specific reasons. Um, you could store a book in a cold warehouse. Um, you discover books on your own. You read other people's reviews. It's a fungible product, so if I buy a book from one person versus another, it doesn't matter. There were a lot of features about books that made them an attractive place to start to build Amazon. And for me, stick shift is the same thing. Um, it, it has a lot of features that I find really attractive. Mm, interesting, interesting. So, gee, I'll, I'll use your, your short version. Um, it was about a year ago you and I first made contact. We had a number of discussions on other topics, but 
I was really impressed by your business philosophy and your management philosophy, and particularly the way you spoke about working with people and building a team. And that mm -hmm. stuck with that stuck with me. And when Kathleen and I started this show, I thought there's a guy that I need to get on the show because um, that stuck in my mind. Having come up in first the corporate world, the old style production and accounting management led companies, and then on my own, and then in the marketing world as well. I, I'm used to that old style. And then when we spoke and your philosophy shone through, I thought this is brilliant. Would you like to tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, so at a high level, there's two things that I try to do with my team. The first, and I'm stealing this from a book that I've, I've read numerous times. Uh, it's called Turn the Ship Around. Um, in a traditional organization, you push information up to authority. Mm -hmm. So the frontline worker, the lower level people, they create reports, they create PowerPoints, whatever, and that's delivered to management. And then management digests that information and management makes a decision. That's pushing information up to authority. Instead, what I try to do is push authority down to information. Mm -hmm. So um, what I try to do is help people to be able to make decisions and ship those decisions on their own uh, with uh, as little interference from me as possible. Um, so ultimately, if each person is very clear on how I'm going to measure their performance and they're clear on what they are responsible for improving, um, then as long as I can get out of their way, they should be able to do that on their own. Um, and so really, and then the second layer is as they try to ship whatever it is they're going to ship, um, the second part is they are very likely are, are going to hit obstacles. So it could be that uh, they have a skill gap. They, they want to do something that they don't know how to do. Um, they have a knowledge gap. Uh, mm -hmm. They're operating under a certain set of assumptions or they are lacking information that would help them make a better decision. Um, there is a relationship or a tool gap. Uh, you know, our tool isn't doing what they need it to do. Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be gaps and problems along the way that um, I can help solve for them because of my experience, my knowledge, what have sure. you. Um so at a very high level, that's how I, I like to uh, approach, you know, making the changes and improvements we need to make so that we achieve our goals. Mm. Very good. So you've worked as a business owner, you've worked for agencies and, and even in the corporate world, what have been some of the highlights? Um, I'd say the highlights have been the surprises. Mm. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked in a number of client accounting campaigns where we initially had one hunch and we shipped something and the data came back indicating something completely different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about ad campaigns in particular, the ad creative or the targeting that ended up working that all the beers in the world would never have gotten my brain to come up with that idea. <laughs> but we just happened um we happened upon it um i'm a little bit limited in terms of what i can say sure about things that i've worked on for clients um but you know ultimately and i think this is one of the things that really drew me to the startup world a lot of the missions that i've helped serve i consider to be fairly noble um, you know, I worked for a coding boot camp for a while, and you know the, the aim of the coding boot camp is to uh, help people get very good uh, jobs relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and a number of the students who went through those that program, how do I put this? There were so many barriers and obstacles to them making a change, getting out of the world they were in and into this other world, that if not for the boot camp, they, they could never have opened that door on their own. Uh, sure. Um, 
same thing. I worked with a, for all intents and purposes, we'll call it a, a book publishing or a story publishing company. Again, same thing. Um, they were really helping to reduce the friction of trying to get something published. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, everyone that I've worked for to varying degrees, some less noble than others, but all, I think, creating like genuinely valuable impacts for the people they were working with. Um, Very good. So I could actually see the impact of, of what happened. Good. <clears throat> no, excellent. So I, I'd like to ask you specifically about the Stick Shift Driving Academy, because in mm-hmm. today's today's world of automatic vehicle dom- dominance, it, it sounds incongruous that people should be interested in learning how to drive stick shifts. I'm biased because having lived all my life, most of my life in Africa, automatics were as rare as hen's teeth for most of those years. So we had to learn to drive stick shift. And in fact, sure. in South Africa, to this day, if you take your driving test in an automatic, you are not permitted to drive a stick shift. There is a separate mm-hmm. test, uh, and I think in other parts of the world the same. But in, in discussions before the show, you were telling me that the stick shift driving is actually alive and well in the real world with uh, mm-hmm. se- several categories of people. Uh, could you tell our audience a little bit more about who likes to drive a stick shift? Yeah. So we have three personas that we serve. Um, The first are professionals, Mm -hmm. uh, or at least people who are doing this for work purposes. Um, So that could be uh, someone getting a valet parking attendant job, working for UPS. In many UPS locations, they still have stick shift trucks, so you have to know how to drive a stick shift. A lot of folks working in the trades where the work truck is an old stick shift. Mm -hmm. Um, Longshoremen who are moving vehicles off of boats. Uh, And there are a bunch of other uh, similar situations, but ultimately they're learning stick because it's going to help them to make money. Um, The second population is travelers who are going to be traveling to a part of the world where either the rental cars are only available as a stick shift Mm -hmm. or the stick shift rental car is going to be significantly cheaper than uh, the automatics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was why I learned. I was like, hey, I'd rather spend my money on wine and cheese than on a transmission. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the third population is uh, is the the enthusiast, um, uh, but the amateur enthusiast. Um, So and usually it's either their significant other in their life, or maybe their parent has a stick shift car that they want to drive. I can't tell you how many husband, wife, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, what have you have called saying, Hey, my significant other tried to teach me. It turned into a fight. (laughs) Um, So it's either that, or they're going to be getting their own stick shift car. Uh, But what's interesting is the vehicles they're going to drive are not crazy cars. We're talking about Mazda Miata, Jeep Mm -hmm. Wrangler, uh, Volkswagen Golf, Subaru WRX. I think in the entire history of the company, we've only sold uh, one lesson to someone who was getting a Corvette and one lesson to someone who is going to be driving a Ferrari. Really? Um, everyone else they're driving, I'm not going to say ordinary cars, but these are not crazy performance cars. Right. Um, they're right. driving cars that are probably usually under 250 to 300 horsepower. Yeah. Wow. So, <clears throat> going on from that to tell our audience a little bit more about how your business works. You touched on it earlier, but I, I think you mm-hmm. could expand on that. And I'm sure it'll be interesting for a lot of our audience. Yeah, so at a very high level, uh, what we do is we handle the marketing and sales. So uh, we attract the customer to the website, Mm -hmm. and then uh, we close the deal, usually by talking with the customer on the phone. Um, Once the lesson is booked, the instructor then talks with the customer. They agree where to meet for the lesson. Um, They meet up in a parking lot and spend a couple of hours together learning the, the very basics. Um, so from a, a, a functional or practical purpose, the business is organized similar to the way Airbnb or eBay would work, mm-hmm. where, uh, you know, if you were an Airbnb host, you'd be responsible for 
the entire guest experience, Airbnb is responsible for attracting the customer and then facilitating the sale. And uh, just leading on from that, you, you have um, instructors available all over the United States, do you? Yep. So currently we have instructors, I think, in 49 out of the 50 largest metro markets. Mm -hmm. uh, we're aiming to be in the remaining 51 uh, by the spring of 2021. Very good. Excellent. So I'm going to turn a little bit philosophical on here uh, on you here, but what is the most important factor in determining business success or failure in your opinion? Oh man, take your pick. Um, the most. Focusing on the urgent and important. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to have the biggest impact that must be done right now and blocking out everything that is not the urgent and important. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. that statement distills so many things. First, that assumes that you understand what's going to have impact and you've properly evaluated it. Um, you understand how quickly you're going to be able to uh, make an impact on that important thing that needs to be done. You know, it's the urgent part um, and how quickly it, it's going to impact the business. And it assumes that you're able to uh, say no to everything that's not urgent and important. Um, and that's why I think what's especially difficult in an early stage business is there's so many things vying for my attention, so many fires and from an emotional perspective, probably the most difficult thing is to look at a problem and say, this hurts, but I'm not going to put my attention here because there's something else that's more important. important. Yeah. And oftentimes that more important thing isn't hurting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. And so, so true. I have to sit with that pain, that discomfort and let it keep happening while I go focus on the bigger thing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Very good. Very good answer that. Very and so true. Yeah. We're we're running towards the end of our time. So I think we need to ask you how can people contact you, G? Yeah. Uh, so the best way to do that is just directly through our website. Okay. Uh, which is stick shift driving academy dot com. Um, we're on Twitter, but I think I tweet twice a year. I'm like the <laughs> social media savvy 37 year old you'll ever meet. So you're not going to get banned from Twitter just now or deplatformed <laughs> or whatever it's called. <laughs> okay. No. So, so that's the message. If, if someone wants to contact you for six shift driving or uh, consulting or anything else to go to the website and you've got a contact mm -hmm. form on there. Great. No, that's mm -hmm. super. Well, so, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciated that. And, on behalf sure. of Peter and myself, thank you. And thank you all so very much for tuning into our show. We so appreciate you. We love reading your comments. So do please keep them coming. And if anyone out there is interested in becoming a guest on our show, please don't hesitate to reach out to Peter or myself. And if you're enjoying our shows, please, I would ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.